Church family, before we pray, I want you to hear this. The gospel is not about what we have done for God, but what God has done for us by sending his son Jesus from heaven to earth. We say that again before we pray. The gospel is not about what we have done for God, but what he has done for us by sending his son Jesus from heaven to earth. Let's pray. God, I pray that that truth will be clear to us today. That we are not sitting here as redeemed believers because of anything that we've done. That we are here as members of the household of God because of Jesus. Because Jesus came. Because he sacrificed himself as the perfect unblemished lamb. He bore the wrath of God on our behalf. And he conquered death, hell, and the grave. God, bring us to that place in our hearts and in our minds this morning. A place where we see Jesus for who he is, seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Bring us to a place where we see our depravity and bow down to God with thankfulness. God, I pray that you would use me to speak the word of God for the glory of God this morning. We will walk away from this passage seeing it more clearly. And we will walk in obedience for your glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I so much want you to get that truth this morning, and I pray that you have. That the gospel is not about us, but about God. It's about Christ. It's about what he has done for us. Last week we talked about, on the Easter service, the greatest story ever told. That it was Jesus who came from heaven to earth. It was Jesus who was born of a virgin. It was Jesus who lived the perfect sinless life. It was Jesus who was nailed to the cross to bear our sins. It was Jesus who died on the cross. And it was Jesus that rose from the tomb. And it is only through Jesus, through Christ alone, that we are now saved as believers and redeemed. So often we, we forget that truth and we think that Christianity is something that we've done. Something that we've earned. In reality, we owe God a debt we cannot pay, so Jesus paid that debt. And now we walk in obedience to Jesus out of thankfulness, love, awe, and allegiance. When you grab to that truth, church, it changes your life. It kills pride. You walk in humility and you show up to church ready to worship Him. You, you live every day ready to worship Him. Ready to serve Him. It changes your purpose. It changes your meaning. It changes what you think about God's people and what you think about the church, what you think about Christ. It changes you. Because of who Jesus is. So we've been on this journey through the book of Ephesians, and we took a couple of weeks off of Palm Sunday, right, and Easter, and now we're back on this journey. Before I get to the passage we're going to be looking at in Ephesians 4, if you remember, this is our third sermon out of Ephesians 4. We're getting there. But I want to remind us where we've been. So turn your Bibles to Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1, you remember one of the first sermons I preached through this letter to the Ephesians, to church at Ephesus. And it was called, In Christ I Am. Verse 3 says, Blessed. Verse 4, Chosen. Verse 5, Predestined. Verse 5 again, Adopted. Verses 7, Verse 7, Redeemed, Forgiven. Verse 8 and 9, Enlightened. Verse 13, sealed. Verse 14, assured. 
And so in Christ, we are, as followers of Christ, blessed, chosen, predestined, adopted, redeemed, forgiven, enlightened, sealed, and assured. And I want us to grab again that truth that this is about God. It's about Christ. It's about who He is in our life. That salvation is not about us or what we've done or what we can do or, or how gifted we are. It's about Christ. Us as people who were enemies of God, dead in our trespasses and sin, us who owed God a debt we could not pay back. Jesus came and sealed us. Redeemed us. In Ephesians 2.10, not only did he save us, but Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship, creating Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in it. So not only did he adopt us and, and chose us and redeemed us and sealed us, he is using us as his workmanship. Like let that, let, grab that. The God of the universe that created all things who we sinned against sent his son Jesus, our Savior, to redeem us and is now going to use us. What a truth that we need to grab onto this morning. Can you believe it? We were enemies. Alienated and hostile against him. And he saved us, redeemed us, and brought us into his family. And now wants to use us. So he's given us meaning and purpose. Knowing those truths, now here we are in Ephesians chapter 4. And he's talking about unity in the body of Christ, the body of believers, the church. So now here we are. God has given the, great, the gift of grace, God's favor to his bride. And he is expecting his bride, us, followers of Christ, to respond in obedience. That this obedience does not earn us salvation. There is a response that we have been saved. And so let me ask you before we get into this passage of scripture. Are you thankful that you've been redeemed? Are you thankful that God has saved you and redeemed you? Bore the wrath of God on your behalf. Are you thankful? Because if you are, that, that should change how you live. If Christianity is about you, you've earned the right to be entitled. But if it's about Christ... You should be walking in obedience and humility. You see, we live in a time in American church where people are preoccupied with how many bodies are in the building. We live in a culture where people have shown up to church to be entertained and to feed their consumer driven mentality. But is that the church? That God designed. Is that the church that Jesus gave his life for? People entitled and consumer driven. Looking to be appeased with their style of worship. Is that the church that Jesus gave his life for? No it's not. But in his passage of scripture, he's going to tell us his plan for the church. He's going to tell us how to build up the church. And how he wants the church to operate. So these points we're getting ready to look at this morning are simply what God has called the church and gifted the church to do for his glory. We serve God in response to what he has done for us. And so the title of the sermon, it's a call to build up the church. This is what he's called us to do here. So you know the first three chapters of Ephesians were theology, were doctrine driven. The next three chapters of Ephesians are more practical application. So he has told us what he's done for us. And now 
Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, has shown us in these words, right, what we are to do in response to the gospel. So let's look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7. Just talked about unity in the body, and now, verse 7, but grace. God's favor toward the unworthy. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Given to who? Who's it given to? The church. So I must ask the question, who's this grace given to? The church. So who is the church? It's the body of believers. So when we say we're going to church, most times people say this drywall and wood. This is not the church. Okay, this building is not the church. We are. So you say you're going to church. That doesn't mean you're going to go sit in your pew. It means you're going to unite with the body of believers to magnify King Jesus. And we can do that out in the parking lot. So let's realize who we're talking to here. So grace has been given to who? To each one of the church, to the body of believers. Okay, the bride of Christ, who he's called to make disciples. That's what he's commissioned us to do. Okay, if we look through scripture, he's commissioned us to make disciples. But grace was given to each one of us, the church, according to the measure of Christ's gift. This word gift here, we need to pay attention to, because it's talking about spiritual gifts, but it's a different Greek word. And so often, if you don't study Greek or, or look at the original manuscripts, you don't realize that it's a different word here that's used. So Paul uses a different word here for gift than is used in 1 Corinthians. You must ask the question, why? Why? Because the gift is not about us, but it's about Christ. The word here, the Greek word for gift, it implies freeness. Freeness. That the gift, the spiritual gifts that we have, were given. Because of the grace of Christ. So not only is chapter 1 pointing to what Christ has done for us. But here even in chapter 4. When it's talking about the gifts that we have. It's about Christ. The freeness of the gift that Christ has given us. And not only Christ but the grace of Christ. And so the word here is talking about the same spiritual gifts as 1 Corinthians, but the word here implies the freeness. Can you believe it? It's what it's saying. Can you believe it? That Jesus who redeemed us has now gifted us to be his workmanship. And so what it's what it pumping up here is Christ. That it's Christ who gave it to us. And so he, th these verses of scripture, we're going to read all the way through verse 16 here in a moment. And we'll get there. But this whole verse of scripture is about unity in the body. And when people use their gifts, it builds up the church. It makes disciples. And so this verse of scripture says the body of Christ then is being built up when believers use the gift for God's glory. The gift from Christ. The free gift. So, so often we think, well, what's my gift? What's my gift? Again, you're, it's good to know that, but you're missing the point. It's from Christ. It's your gift from Him for God's glory. It's a beautiful, beautiful passage of Scripture. Continue on, verse 8. Therefore it says, When He ascended on high... He led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. That's from Psalm 68. And what that's been talking about is Jesus who came, who rode in, who died, who conquered, who rose from the dead. That's what this is talking about. 
So with these verses of scripture, all the way here through verse 10, is talking about Jesus. That he gave the gift to men because it was his gifts to give because he earned that when he came from heaven to earth. He earned that when he rode in on Palm Sunday. He earned that when he died on the cross and bore the wrath of God. And he earned that when he rose from the tomb. That's why the different word here is used. And so, yes, the body of Christ is built up when believers use their gifts for God's glory. But you have to see what picture Paul is painting here. That he has given you a gift. Christ has given you a gift because Christ earned the right to give you a gift. He sovereignly chose your gift to give you to build up his church that he died for. That's what Paul's telling us. It's not about you promoting your gift. It's not about me standing up here and saying, well, I am the pastor. Because I have the gift of communication. I hope. It's about me standing up here and telling you that Christ came and redeemed me and saved me and somehow he saw me fit to allow me to preach the word of God to you. It's not about my gift, but it's about the grace of Christ who actually would use a wretched sinner like me. And so I want to be found faithful because of what Christ has done. And you should too. So God has called you to be his workmanship. He came, Jesus came and he died for you and he adopted you and he sealed you and he's using you as his workmanship and he has sovereignly paid the price and sovereignly gave you a gift that he has put on you, on purpose for building up his church. So how do you respond to that? Like me, it makes me want to just sit down and just take a moment. That the God of the universe gave his life and then rose from the tomb and said, now I'm going to build my church up using the people that I died for and I'm going to gift each one of them uniquely and how I see fit because I'm all wise and I'm all knowing and I've earned the right to gift my church that I died for. How do you respond to that? Besides just saying, hey, God, I'm going to use whatever you give me for your glory. I'm going to serve you. I'm going to find out what you've called me to do, and I'm going to sell out all in the glory of God. That is completely different than if people who call themselves Christians that come and sit in a pew and look to be entertained versus Christians who walk into the church ready to serve the church and use their gifts for building up the church for the glory of God. That is two different Christians. God has not called us to sit and consume. Jesus gave his life to gift you to build up the church. That's what the verses are telling us. So when it's quoting Psalm 68 right there, it's telling you what Jesus did to gift you. He died for you. He sealed you. He gifted you for his glory. So why is the word different? <laughs> because the gift didn't cost you anything, but it cost Jesus everything. That's why the Greek word is different. Because it's free to you and me. It's free. It cost Jesus his life. May we respond in obedience. Three things I want you to grab about gifts. So often in the church world, especially right now with some growing denominational teachings, that sometimes gifts are promoted as higher than others. <laughs> Which is sinful. So there's three things I want you to grab about these gifts that God sovereignly gives. 
Number one, gifts shouldn't be sought after. He'll give you the gift that he wants you to have for building up his church. Well, I feel like I need this. Well, you're not the all-knowing, all-wise God. So I promise you, I would not have chosen the gift of pastor. Um, my weekends would be a lot more pleasant. There's a burden you carry around on Friday and Saturday until you try to get your sermon finished before you realize that you're still working on it Saturday night and then you finally get to where you feel like God wants it and you go, okay, I can go to sleep. And then you go to sleep and your alarm's set for early in the morning but you wake up three or four times because you're afraid you're going to miss the 8.30 service. Okay? And so last night I have a headache and uh, at 12 o'clock I took two Advil and I think it's the pollen. It's killing Okay, and I mowed yesterday, and it just keeps growing, right? It's ridiculous. <laughs> um, but I took, and so I wake up this morning, and Deanna's like, how are you feeling? And I was like, I didn't wake up until my alarm went off. Thank the Lord for Advil. If that's the kid, that's the trick. Okay? Um, but I wouldn't have picked that. It's not something I would have sought after, and I desired it, Right? Because God placed that. He gifted me with that. And he called me. And I don't say, oh, he gifted me. Uh, it's just what he called. And so I'm humble. The same way that you should be for the gift he's given. So we don't, we, don't, we don't seek after. We respond. Number two. Gifts should always be used. Something we need to grab. Why should it always be used? Because God chose you. To give that gift to. For building up his church. He chose you. So it should always be used. Okay. Thirdly. Gifts shouldn't be exalted. My gift is not any greater than yours. It's not. Other people's gifts are not any greater than yours. We're all part of the body. And working together, we build the body up. So know that. These gifts are about God. They're about Christ. They're about what He has done. Church, this is why you hear me preach that membership matters. I had a, somebody come to me and say, I've been coming to your church for the past year and I have, I have understood more deeply why membership matters. And I'm like, well, amen. Thank the Lord. God died for his church. The letter is written to the church. God gifts his church to build up his church. So you need to be a part of the church. I don't know how else to say that. That's why membership matters. Coming to a church for 20 years and not serving the church is not using your gift that God gave you to build up the church. You hear people say it. Well, I can use my gift without the church. How? How can you use your gift without the church since it's for building up the church? How? You can consume from the church. That can happen. You can sit in a pew. That can happen. But you can't build up the church not being a part of the church. Membership matters. Membership matters. Can you use your gift if you're not coming to church? People will say that. Well, I can be a Christian without being a part of the church. Sure. But can you live in obedience? No. You can't. Because you use your gifts in response to what Christ has done for you 
to build up the church. So, can you use your gifts if you're not coming church, if you're not a member of the church, if you're not serving the church, and not seeking the lost? No. You can't. You see, the gates of hell will not triumph over the church. The church is God's plan A. Guess what God's plan B is? There's not one. So it's the church. Christ died for the church. Christ's gifts go to the church. That's why you're part. You should be a part of the church. So unity in the church comes from everyone using the gifts they have been given for the glory of God. Now I want you to hear me say this. Unity does not mean uniformity. Your gifts are unique because God sovereignly gifted you. So we don't all have to be the same. Matter of fact, look like the church and look like the kingdom. We should be different. That the unifier is Christ. So we all come together to glorify Christ. Verse 11. Speaking of these gifts, he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers, verse 12, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. So he gifts you for building up the body. Number two, the body of Christ is built up. Number one, when believers use their gifts. Number two, when saints are being equipped for the work of the ministry. So what's my role as shepherd and teacher? What's the elders here? What's our role as shepherds and teachers? It is to equip you for the work of the ministry, not to do ministry for you. Now, I'm to do ministry with you, just not for you. This is God's plan for the church. Not to leave it to the professionals, because my gift is not any greater than yours. But it's for us to come together to use our gifts to build up the church. And my responsibility is to lead you, to love you, provide for you, and protect you. To protect you from false teachings and heresy. To help uh, teach you the word of God. So that the Holy Spirit will illuminate the word of God. And so the Holy Spirit will apply those truths to your life. To, to, to grow you. It's for us to develop leaders. It's for us as shepherds and elders. To make sure that the ministries of the church line up with the word of God. And so that's how we are to equip you. Make sure that Sunday school literature is not heretical. Make sure it's in D groups, that you're learning the Word of God. Make sure that all the ministries, men's and women's ministry, are teaching what is true. To equip you. To help shepherd you and disciple you as you parent and disciple and shepherd your children. To, to be with you and, and make sure your marriages reflect the gospel. So that you learn the Word of God, learn the theology of God and who God is. Because that's what we're called to do. Right? To make sure that we are equipping you so that you can go out into this lost world and share the good news of Jesus and point them to the truths of Scripture, to the Word of God. And so as pastors, this is a cool thing to witness, to see the Holy Spirit draw His people to Him. And so often we get to see, you know, I've seen a lot here in the Union. I've seen people who... We're, we're um, barely in the church, right? Barely using the gifts, like just, just kind of in the church, to now just jumping straight in the pool and serving and being used and, and, and just on fire for the Lord. And it's such a cool thing to see the Holy Spirit do that, that, that we get up here and we lead and we develop leaders and we preach the Word of God and, and the Holy Spirit just grows and sanctifies a body of believers and people start just being all in and being on mission for God and sharing the good news. It's just an awesome thing to see. Kind of reminds you of Acts 2 and the people are devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to prayers, to 
to, to breaking of bread. And so they were selling their possessions and giving to all those in need. And the Lord was adding to their number daily. It was believers that were on fire for God. And it's such a cool thing to see that we as elders and teachers and shepherds, we get to preach to you and to see the Holy Spirit grow you and put you on fire and to send you out into this lost and dark world to be on fire for him and do his work. It's an awesome thing to see. And so often here we get to rejoice in that. It's not anything we've done. We, we've, just, we've just done our gift. We preach the word of God and we equip you and we help develop you. And you grow and you're used for the glory of God. And it's just awesome to see. And so here at New Union, we've got people that are called to missions. We got, we're licensing pastors who, who, who feel the call to be a pastor. And they're, they're growing in that and they're teaching and one day we're going to send them out to lead other churches for the glory of God. And, and church, that's it. That we're equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. And so if I, if I could just share with you, I, I, wish I, could, I wish I could just spend more time sharing about the fifth grade Sunday school teacher that built into me. I wish I could share more about senior and adult couple that would invite me over to their house and build into me when I was a teenager or my aunt and uncle who took me to church a lot when I was growing up or men who would pray with me on Mondays or men who would take me to homes to share the gospel with people. I wish I could just share name after name after name of people that were in the church who took me under their wing and helped grow me and disciple me and teach the truth of scripture. And so then I want to say this, if we had teenagers stand up here or those in their 20s or 30s, they could stand up here and they could point many of you out by name and say, you built into me when I was an RA. You built into me when I was a kid venture. You built into me when I was a teenager. You invited me over to your house. You taught on this one time and it changed my life as the Holy Spirit grew me in those truths. And that could be said of many of you. And so I want to say, like some of you have been faithful. That the word of God, Brother Danny had went up here and he had preached the word of God for 30 some years faithfully and you responded to the word of God and you used your gifts and you helped lead hundreds of kids and teenagers to the Lord who are now serving in the church. Because you serve the church for the glory of God. Because you let the pastor speak the truth and equip you so you could go and teach teenagers and children and disciple your own children who are now raising their children to glorify God. And so for that I say well done. And so you've seen this church be built up and grow in maturity because generations of faithfulness have responded to the gifts that God has given them. And now we're called to do the same thing over and over again as a new generation rises up and uses their gifts for the glory of God. So for you who spent that time and are still doing it, well done. Let's continue. We've seen it. And so the body of Christ is built up when believers use their gifts. The glory of God is built up when saints are being equipped for the glory of God. Continue on. Verse 13, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Number three, the body of Christ is built up when the word of God is central and faithfully being proclaimed. This is what it's saying here. Until we have attained the unity of the faith, the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. This unity in the faith means when the Word is taught rightly, believers grow spiritually. When the Word is taught rightly, spirit, believers grow spiritually. This knowledge here, so that, that's unity in the faith, this knowledge of the Son of God, this is not salvation, okay? This is talking about deeper sanctification that comes from growing in the Lord through prayer, reading the Bible, fasting, and obedience to the Word. So you see what's happening here. Jesus is saying, hey, I've gifted the church. I've given them pastors and elders to equip them. And I've given them the word of God so that they'll grow in sanctification by the Holy Spirit and living inside of them so that they will grow to be more like me and build up the church. And so you're gifted to build up a church. You've got pastors that are going to equip you to build up a church. You've got the word of God and the Holy Spirit living inside of you to help you grow so you can build up the church. 
What else do you want? Like, what else do we want? We got the Holy Spirit. We got the Word of God. We got pastors teaching us the Word of God. And then God, Jesus has said, and here's you a gift. Here you go. We got everything we need to build up the church, to make disciples. I love what he says. Verse 14. So with me gifting you, with me sealing you with the Holy Spirit, with me giving you pastors, with me giving you the Word of God, with me giving you the Holy Spirit to convict you and to sanctify you. Verse 14. So that we may no longer be children. Tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. You've heard me preach this since I've been here. And you know why? Because I feel like that you're mature believers. If I didn't feel like you're mature believers, I would probably teach. Like I would probably spend the next two months just, just teaching the basics of Christianity. And so I want to say again, if you are being tossed around by false doctrine, grow out of that. Grow out of it. The Holy Spirit lives inside of you. The Word of God here is being taught faithfully. You've got the Word of God. Quit falling for heretical teaching. You've heard it preached here in the past. And you're going to continue to hear it preached here. Quit falling for false heretical teaching. The gospel is not legalism. The gospel is not prosperity gospel. The gospel is not cheap grace. The gospel demands everything from us. We didn't do anything to gain it. It came from Christ alone. And we respond in obedience. We don't follow Christ so we get health and wealth. We don't follow Christ just so to cause the set of rules. We follow Christ because he's our greatest treasure. He's our greatest treasure. Okay? And so we don't need to be tossed to and fro. You want to build up the church? Respond to the gift he's given you. Listen to the pastor's preaching. Read the word of God and let the Holy Spirit illuminate the word of God and sanctify you. We don't have to be tossed to and fro. Rather, verse 15, speaking the truth in love. Well, pastor... You know, I know that some other people and things believe some, some false teaching, but who am I here to judge? You don't have to judge. You just need to speak the truth in love. You just need to speak the truth in love, which is what I try to do. I don't have to fall for, I don't have to let people just lay away and rot away in false teaching because we're trying to love them. You can speak the truth in love. We are, grow, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. We are to grow into Christ, who is the authority. And so it's kind of bookended here. Our gift starts with Christ, and we're to grow to be like Christ. And I love how he ends this, this thought here. Verse 16. From whom the whole body... Not one piece of the body, but the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part, not when the pastors are working properly, not when one believer in the church is working properly. Listen to what it says. When each part, each person that Christ has gifted for building up his body when each part is working properly, makes the body grow. So that it builds itself up in love. You see the picture here? The body grows when we serve God in obedience. When we don't exalt our gifts, but we humbly serve in the gifts that God's given us. And so it's not about one person, but it's about a body coming together, bowing down and serving a holy God and responding to everyone in love because of how much we love God and love others. Do you see the picture? We don't fall for, for the, na the next uh, charismatic thing. We don't fall for the next um, 
big show. We just come to church. We serve the church. We serve Christ. We read our word. We listen to the apostle, the, 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 the pastor's preaching. And we go out in this world and make disciples. We love one another. We encourage one another. We build one another up because we're the same body with different gifts for the glory of God. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And so I end with this. Can you believe it? I got, that's, 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 what I, that's where I landed after reading this. Can you believe it? <laughs> we who were alienated enemies of God, having been redeemed through Christ, are now members of the household of God. Can you believe it that we have been gifted with gifts that the sovereign Lord has given us and chose us to be his workmanship? Can you believe it? <clears throat> Like I stand up here in awe, not standing up here going, it's a good thing God chose me. I stand up here going, I look back at my life and the wretched sinner that I was and I go, can you believe it? Like, can you believe it that he would use me? I'm sure my fifth grade Sunday school teacher is still going. <laughs> right? I, matter of fact, I guarantee it. I was that kid. That's the same place I land. Like me and the fifth grade Sunday school teacher would be like, can you believe it? He'd be like, no, nah, no, nah, me either. Same thing for you. Can you say that? Can you believe it? That God has chosen you, saved you, and now has given you meaning and purpose for building up his church. You know what it should make us want to do? Just bow down and say, God, use me. Use me. That's where I landed 14 years ago. The back of a church bowing down on the ground saying, God, use me. That's where I still land today. Reading this verse of the scripture saying, I can't believe it. I can't believe you'd come and die for me. I can't believe you'd give me, but I want you to use me. So this morning, you need to pray and say, God, I know you've gifted me. I can't believe it, but you have. I know you've redeemed me. I can't believe it, but you did. And I want you to use me. The altar will be open. The pastors will be up here. If you'd like to pray, you can. If you'd like to sit at your pew and pray. If you're not serving, I ask why. If you're not members, I ask why. If you are serving, thank you. Thanks for being the church that God's called you to be. Let's pray. Father, powerful words of Scripture. Sometimes it just makes me pause and I go, I can't believe it. But I'm so thankful, God. And Father, I know there could be someone here that's lost. For the first time, they've actually seen the grace of God. And they've repented of their sins. And they're ready to follow you. So I pray that they'll come and follow you. Maybe there's people here, Father, that won't be used. And you want to use them. And so I pray that they'll take the next step in obedience. Have your way right now, Father. Holy Spirit, move. And may we worship you. In Jesus' name I pray. When